Good evening. Welcome as we gather together for our worship service tonight. Uh, we are in part three of our series called The Time In Between. We get close to the end of the church year and reminds us that at the very end of this world, Jesus is coming back in all of his glory. And so we in-betweeners need to be ready. So part three is a time for watchfulness. And I'd like to uh, uh, welcome all those who are also worshiping with us online. Uh, glad that you could share and we gather together in, with God's word. Uh, one of the things we're looking forward to is uh, the arrival of Jesus and the new Jerusalem, uh, the city of God. That's our opening song or hymn. Please sing along with as you are able. Awake from your slumber, arise from your sleep, a new day is dawning for all those who weep. The people in darkness have seen a great light, the Lord conquered the night. Let us build the city of God. May our tears be turned into dancing. For the Lord, our light and our Lord, has turned the night into day. We are sons of the morning, we are daughters of day, the one who has loved us has brightened our way. Salvation 
by the blood of the Lamb, enter into the throne room of the great I Am. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart, can confess our sins, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. And so we pray, Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should have cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Jesus Christ took up his cross for us and gave his life upon it that we might be redeemed. Through the Holy Spirit, God's love has been poured into your hearts. For the sake of Christ, your sins are forgiven. You have entered into the presence of God. Enter into his presence and be seen by his grace. The privilege of worship him here in this place. Enter into his presence, let us bow before him. Give him glory and honor as we enter in. Let us join together our hearts and voices in the prayer of the day. And we pray, Almighty God and Savior, you have set the final day and hour when we shall be delivered from this world of sin and death. Keep us ever watchful for the coming of your Son, that we may sit with him and all your holy ones at the marriage feast of heaven. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We turn to the Word of God for the second last Sunday of Pentecost, technically Pentecost 25, and it, the scripture lessons prepare us for the time when Jesus will arrive. Paul, in his, in his uh, epistle, chapter 5, verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians, uh, reminds us who we are we are children of the light. We don't walk in darkness, and we need to be ready because at the unknown time, like a thief in the night, Jesus will return. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep. But let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are asleep, awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. Our verse of the day, Alleluia. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Alleluia. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah 
to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Our gospel lesson, is, which is also our sermon text for tonight, is taken from Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. Uh, Jesus tells a parable about a wedding. Uh, he, the bridegroom, is going to arrive at an unknown, unexpected hour. Uh, let us rise to give honor to the very words of our Savior. He says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of our Lord. Let us confess our faith in the triune God with the words of the Apostles' Creed. We join together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for our sermon hymn. It's a traditional hymn based on our parable that Jesus is teaching us tonight.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The Word of God, as I mentioned earlier, is our Gospel lesson, Matthew chapter 25. Uh, let us bow our heads for a brief prayer. O oh Lord our God, you have given us your word to prepare us for all times and for the day of your coming. So as we await that day, uh, sanctify us with your truth, for your word is the truth. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, Dad came to his little seven-year-old son in the middle of the week and said, Johnny, on a Saturday sometime soon, I'm going to take you to the zoo. And Johnny got all excited and said, okay, Dad, let's go, let's go. And he said, no, not today. It's not the right time. It's not a, a Saturday. In the future, we will go. Saturday arrived, and Johnny was out of bed at 530, and waking and shaking his dad and said, Dad, it's time to go. It's time to go to the zoo. And Dad said, not this Saturday, Johnny. Today I have to go to work. And so the next Saturday rolled around. Johnny didn't get up at 5.30. Matter of fact, it was the normal time. And as he walked into the kitchen, he said, Dad, are we going to the zoo? And Dad said, Johnny, look outside. It's raining today. Today's not a good day to go to the zoo. And so week upon week happened. And the day for going to the zoo still didn't happen. And finally, Johnny just uh, wasn't thinking about it all that much anymore. And one particular Friday night, while everyone in the house was asleep, Johnny just couldn't sleep, so he decided to get up and play video games through the middle of the night. And so when it came time to get up, Dad was shaking Johnny and saying, Johnny, today's the day for the zoo! And you can imagine how Johnny felt. He has one of two choices. Either he can spring up no matter how tired he is and says, okay, Dad, let's go. Or he more likely will just want to roll over in bed and say, forget it. That's a little parable in line with the one that Jesus told about the arrival of himself, the bridegroom, and when it's getting time for the wedding feast, and it seems like it just isn't coming. And uh, we expect it, and we might be ready at one time, and then we kind of get tired out and not thinking about it so much anymore. And Jesus is telling this parable so that we don't turn into Johnny's to just roll over and go back to sleep and forget all about it. Uh, we don't want to forget about his arrival. It's a whole lot more fantastic than a zoo visit. But... We're in the time in between. And we're getting closer and closer to that time when Jesus has promised to come back in all of his glory. But because it seems to be taken quite a while, that's why Jesus teaches the, the parable for all of us. And it's a time for watchfulness. We, Jesus wants us to be ready and watchful for all the times when he might come back and he's not going to tell us what day it's going to be. He wants us to be ready and watchful at all times. So what we see in our parable are two main thoughts. It's a time for watchfulness and we see what happens when you're not watching and we'll also see exactly what it means to keep watching, what that means for all of us in our lives today. So let, let's look at the parable that Jesus taught. First of all, a couple of uh, explanations of what's happening, because we don't live a, 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 in preparation for a wedding feast 2,000 years ago. First of all, it's an American custom that the groom does not see the bride all the day of the wedding until she walks down the aisle, and then he sees her for the very first time. But that's not how it was in ancient times. In ancient times, the wedding party, like the bridesmaid or braids of the virgins, were at the bride's home. That's where they got ready, and they were waiting for the groom to show up. 
because the groom would come to the bride's home and carry her in a carriage or other transportation to where the ceremony and the celebration would be. So that's the setting of where they're waiting. And the groom didn't show up in daylight hours. It's getting late, it's getting dark. They all have their little lamps to light the way so that they can uh, escort the groom when he arrives to the doorstep of his future bride. And the lamps we're talking about, I have an example for you here. It's not 2,000 years old, but I bought this in a museum store in Jerusalem as an example, a remade model of what a, an oil lamp would be like at the time of Christ. And as you can see, it's not very big. It doesn't hold a whole lot of oil. There's the center opening to put, pour in more olive oil when you need more fuel, and the smaller hole where you would have the wick come out, so that's where you would light it. And so you can see that from the size of it, this at the most would burn a couple of hours. It's not going to hold that much oil for fuel, so you need to carry some along with, and that's exactly what was going on with the bridesmaids of the virgins who uh, were waiting for the groom to show up, and the time was running out, and they just didn't know what was happening, and they started falling asleep. Uh, let me share again uh, the beginning verses of Jesus' parable to refresh our minds. At, the, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones did, took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So we see the entire wedding party. The bridesmaids are very similar in a lot of ways. All of them are waiting for the groom to arrive. They're excited at first about uh, the wedding feast to come. Uh, they all have their lamps. They all are waiting for him. They all get tired out as the night goes into midnight and they go back into the house and probably catch a, a little bit of a snooze. But what was the only difference? One group had plenty of oil in their lamps and the other did not they were running out. And to be wise, a wise bridesmaid, is not always so easy because it seems like Jesus is taking a long, long time to come back. He forewarned us that this is how it would be. I don't think any of the writers of the Bible, however, expected that it would be 2,000 years and more. But... Uh, God has a plan and he has a timing and only he knows when the Son of Man is going to come back in all of his glory. Not even the angels in heaven know. But in the meantime, uh, we quit watching so easily. We are not ready to go through all of the time it needs. Uh, give, you, give you a little example. How many of, uh, are you, uh, of you are a Detroit Lions fans? We might have none, we might have a handful, and how long is it going to take for the Detroit Lions to win a Super Bowl? They never have. And I, they might have a better chance this year, but I wouldn't put any bets on it. And that is how people look about Jesus' return sometimes. It just seems like it's never going to happen. Maybe it's not going to happen at all. And people start running out of oil in their lamps and their faith uh, burning brightly for Jesus is starting to dim and disappear and run out of strength. But I can guarantee you that God is going to keep his promises and Jesus is going to return for a Super Bowl celebration that's more fantastic than anything you could ever imagine. The announcement is going to come. It's time. The bridegroom is here. 
At midnight, the cry rang out, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. And so they scurry and get ready for the bride, uh, the groom to come down the road, and they're getting their lamps together, and we see ten bridesmaids, all exactly the same, except for one small difference. See, all ten were looking for the bridegroom, all ten were excited, all ten got tired and sleepy because they had to wait so long, and the only difference was that one group had plenty of oil to replenish their lamps, and the other group had none. That's a picture of the Christian church on this earth today. Uh, people, some are ready and waiting and have plenty of oil in their lamps of faith so that no matter how long it takes or how difficult the process might be in going through this earthly life, uh, they have enough to get ready. Might even kind of doze and sleep a little bit, but as soon as the word comes out, the bridegroom is coming, we jump up and are ready to go because we have our lamps of faith replenished through the word. The others, not so much. Their oil of faith is running out and they don't have a further source to replenish it. And that's what happens when people not only get drowsy about spiritual things, but allow all the events and activities of this whole world to uh, distract them and get them away from the main thing that we need for when the bridegroom comes, and that's trust and faith in the Lord. And so when we get all busy and working with all of the good things of this life, it doesn't have to be sins, but we're so tied up with school and work and getting things done around the house and all of the other things that should be done, uh, we worried about our finances and putting this all together. It's just so easy to let that flame of faith just start wickering out. And for some, it might go out completely. If they get so distracted and fall asleep from the most important things of life, they're not going to have any oil to replenish it. What happened with the, uh, the two groups of bridesmaids? Uh, Jesus is coming. So the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. Now that might seem a, a little bit cruel or unfair, uh, why wouldn't the wise ones, if they have enough, share with the foolish ones? But you see, Jesus was making a point with his parable here to show that you can't do it for someone else. You can replenish your oil, but you can't just do it for someone else. When the time comes, we want to share the gospel now. When the time runs out, it's, it's no longer possible. Our time of grace comes to an end. So a husband cannot believe for his wife. And parents cannot believe for their children. We each need that source of oil on our own. You can't just give it, give it at the last minute. And certainly we want to be ready. And how do we go to the store? If we're running out of oil, we don't want to wait till the last minute. We need to go to the store now and get replenished. Our olive oil is the word. Going to the store. Welcome to church. Every time you're opening up Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, I'm not the vendor, they are. They're the ones who have brought the oil that we need that's going to keep our faith burning brightly. And it's not only the gospel writers, it's uh, Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all of the Old Testament writers as well. They brought God's promises of how uh, Messiah and Savior from sin was going to come into this world and take our place at the cross and give his life as a ransom for many. So it, we get replenished whenever we come to the store. 
And we can do that at home too, some of you online. For example, hearing the word of tonight, uh, we are replenishing our supply so that we will have plenty when the time runs out. So we gather together and we want to increase our uh, attention to the word of God because there's so many things that can go astray and get us sleeping away from the most important things of this life. For those who ran out of oil, what happened? Oh, they got back to the wedding feast, but the door was closed. They were not allowed in. They had had a wedding invitation, but now it's like uh, trying to get into a concert, an official concert, after it's already started, the door is closed, you got a ticket too bad, it's already started, you cannot come in. And so Jesus even goes to the extreme to say, I don't know you. Remember, he's talking about people that had all been ready for, for his wedding feast. I would say that these are people that are in churches, in Christian churches, and some can get so distracted with all the allurements of this world that they just run out of oil. And yes, that means that some might even lose their faith entirely and don't have anything when Jesus arrives and he will say, I don't know you. What a sad commentary that would be. And so we continue to encourage each other to come to the Lord Jesus and be ready and certain that uh, he gives us everything we need and be, to be watchful for the day that he arrives. After all, he doesn't want anyone to run out of oil. He doesn't want anyone to think, well, I was baptized and confirmed, that's enough. I was, I'm a member of a church, that's enough. I don't have to follow you so seriously, do I, Jesus? And when the tragedies of life strike, so very often, people, without any oil, lose faith. And things disappear uh, for them entirely. The door might be shut when Jesus comes back. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And that's why he's telling this parable so none of us fall asleep and never wake up. That is so very important to be ready. His key verse for us all. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Keep on watching. Uh, it's one little passage, but it's worth a very important thing of taking it all apart. What does it mean for keeping watch? Uh, we'll look at that in, in examination because... Even if Jesus doesn't return in all of his glory in our lifetimes, and I'm not convinced that it has to be in our lifetimes. Uh, some uh, prophecy preachers say it's got to be anytime soon. Maybe. Maybe not. People have predicted the arrival of Jesus so many times and they've been wrong. Uh, we will see. But if we don't see Jesus arrive in all of his glory ourselves, we still need to apply the same principle to another important event in our lives, and that's when our earthly bodies die. After all, that can happen at any time. Sometimes people have a forewarning of it coming, such as one of our members, Donna, is getting very close to going home to heaven. I uh, saw her on Friday, and she's not really very much awake anymore. Uh, but it's expected. What about all of those who face tornadoes or hurricanes or terrorist attacks or shootings or plain old heart attacks? Uh, they, bam, overnight, a totally unexpected, earthly life might be gone and it's pretty radical. One day you might be uh, going to bed to sleep and the next way you wake up in heaven with the singing with all the saints and the angels or... You might not make it at all if we're not ready. And that's why it's so important to have oil in our lamps and be ready. 
Uh, example just came today. We don't know what happens for any age. Uh, just got a prayer, a prayer request for the Henselin family. They live up in Green Bay, but their people, the mom and dad in the family, are people that our kids would know from school, Martin Luther College, and Jessica, uh, our member, uh, had known them as well. <clears throat> they have five children. Yesterday, the oldest one, who's 12 years old, uh, had some type of accident in the backyard, and his earthly life is done. If there's no oil of faith, how do you handle that? Not only for the little 12-year-old uh, Joel, but the whole family. Uh, those kinds of tragedies are uh, evident in our lives always, and God wants us to be ready and prepared so we have not only confidence for the day of our deaths on this earth, but also of when he returns. Either one could happen so suddenly, and we want to have our faith burning brightly. So Jesus says, keep watch. Keep on watching, literally, is what that says. And uh, just to fill you in on some other Bible passages that use the exact same word, but it's always translated in about four or five different ways. I'd like to share just a couple of them. Uh, <clears throat> in our e e epistle lesson, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, Paul wrote, So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Be awake is the same word. Keep watching for his arrival. And be sober, he continues with that. Let us be sober, not drunk at night, but sober-minded. How? Uh, these are the things we really need from the, from the Spirit. Faith and love and the hope of salvation. Those are the things that we want to focus our minds on so that what we can be awake for whenever Jesus arrives. Uh, another one from Peter, be alert and of sober mind. Same word as keep watching. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, is like a roaring lion looking for someone to, to devour. So resist him, standing firm in the faith. Yes, be alert. He's going to try to attack you with his temptations and try to drag you away from Jesus because after all, you haven't seen him coming back yet. And then Paul writes, it's written in Acts, be on your guard, he tells the Ephesian people. Um, same word, keep watching. Be on your guard, why? Because savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Things are going to get tough. Things are going to get worse. Not only for the Ephesian people he was talking about, but Jesus said, forewarn that there would be more persecutions, more difficulties, people pretending to be messiahs, teaching a whole bunch of wrong, deceiving things. So be on your guard. Watch. Watch out is another way of saying keep on watching. There's so many things that we need to be careful about, whether it's teaching or lifestyle. We want to always be ready uh, following the Lord in our actions, following the Lord in what he teaches. And don't despair. Don't get so upset that you say, yeah, maybe, maybe there's no wedding coming at all. That's one of the devil's temptations, isn't it? To try to just get us to give up. Keep watching. And we, well, there will come that day when we will rejoice at the arrival of the bridegroom, Jesus. You see, our parable uh, was about all of us, the church, the believers, uh, being bridesmaids. But when the actual wedding feast arrives, guess who we are going to be? Not bridesmaids, but the bride. Jesus is the groom, and in other illustrations, he portrays all of us and believers as the bride were coming in and having a joyful celebration. We see this in the book of Revelation. That let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come 
and his bride has made herself ready. How are all of us as the bride going to be ready? It says next, fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. What's that represent? White and clean, perfection and purity. That can only come from Jesus. We certainly can't make that wedding dress of, of our own actions. We always mess things up and get it dirty. But by faith in Jesus, we are given that proper preparation, that beautiful dress that we can wear and get ready for. So keep watching. Before you know it, we will rejoice and be glad for the wedding is here. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And let us rise and sing another classic hymn about the bridegroom and the bride. Turn to the Lord in prayer, and I'd like to especially keep in prayer Donna Bethel, who might be close to going home. Also, the Henselin family, that they might find comfort in their loss of their 12-year-old son. Uh, that's, uh, his name was Joel Henselin. Um, and then we, I, I, there's many procedures coming up for Michael Sweeney. We'd like to keep him in our prayers as well. Also, the, uh, we're going to pray, continue to pray for guidance for uh, Pastor Matthew Holtz, who is considering our call to serve here at Risen Savior. Uh, he has not made a decision yet, so we want to keep him in prayer as well. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to you that you constantly remind us in Holy Scripture about the second coming of your Son and press upon us all how important it is for us to heed these warnings lest we, like the foolish virgins, be found unprepared for your unexpected and yet certain and sudden coming. Move all in our midst who have not yet accepted the bridegroom as our Savior to do so at once that they may have the oil of faith in their lamps. Grant that all of us who already have this oil of faith may keep replenishing it as we turn to your word and also receive the blessing of, of your Holy Supper. Move us by your Holy Spirit to read our Bibles daily, to have family devotions, to attend services regularly and partake of the Lord's Supper frequently in order that we may have a never failing supply of, oil, of the oil of faith. Use that, O oh Lord, to guide us through all the troubles and trials of this earthly life. And so we pray for those who are having all difficulties, people that are on our hearts and minds. We pray especially for Donna Bethel, whom you might be calling home to heaven soon. We ask for your prayer, for your guidance, for the procedures that Michael Sweeney needs. Uh, help to find uh, solutions and put your hand of healing upon him. 
and we pray especially for those who have lost loved ones, especially the Henselin family, whose uh, young boy uh, was called home tragically in an accident at, right at their home. So be with that whole family, continue to bless them with strength of faith in the midst of their sorrow and grief. Help us all to be ready for that time when you will return. And in, as we wait in the time in between, we have much work to do, the word of God to share and bring to others. We ask that you would continue to guide our congregation here, especially as Pastor Holtz considers our call to serve with me. Continue to guide him, O oh Lord, and help him to see exactly where the best place might be to use all of the, uh, the pastoral talents that the Lord has given him. Guide him, guide our congregation and his as well, as we pray all of this in your saving name, and also join in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. be seated for our closing hymn. that we could gather together from near and far. And uh, would like to just mention there's a couple of special things coming up in December. Uh, it, may, it may seem like we're rushing the season a little bit, but we're really not. <laughs> uh, there's two uh, different events in December that I'd like to uh, alert you about. Uh, one is a Wednesday service uh, that will be our main Advent service. It's on a Wednesday night at 7 p.m. December 13th. There's an article in the bulletin about that. Uh, there, it's going to be an Advent by candlelight, and the idea is that uh, people will be setting up tables inside the sanctuary to serve a little uh, dessert or something else uh, to uh, invite other people. Uh, there's the host or hostesses invite other people to come for the special Advent service. So that's on Wednesday, December 13th. I'm announcing it so early, it's a month away, but we need to prepare and know how many people can host a table, how many people would just like to attend. So there's sign-up sheets for that. And then on December 9th, on a Saturday, 
uh, through, through the day. There'll be more in the bulletin on this next week. But there's also a sign-up sheet for attending a special family event. It's not a worship service. It's going to be a family event. Uh, Sandy Burke has a bunch of things prepared. Everyone can make decorations and wreaths and have uh, an enjoyable time together on that Saturday. I think it starts at 1. And also, that's the day that we're going to decorate the church. That's the 9th, Saturday, the 13th, everything will be decorated. And so, uh, I, I, I know that sometimes uh, some of our men think, well, that's a woman's thing, that's a kid's thing. No, it, we're going to be decorating the church, so men, we need your help too, so sign up and think about it if you can't sign up tonight. Uh, for the 9th, December 9th. And as long as I'm talking about future dates, there's one thing that I wanted to ask all of you to think about. And uh, the Christmas schedule this year is uh, Christmas Eve is a Sunday. So I'm planning on having a normal Sunday service and then a Christmas Eve candlelight service that we normally have. The big question for all of you here tonight is, should we have a Saturday service? It would take uh, probably no more preparation for me because I would you be using the same service on Sunday morning like I normally do. Uh, but uh, if we had a Saturday night service like usual on December 23rd, would you come? And if everyone says to themselves, no, I, I just soon just come on Christmas Eve, well, then... then I hate to have everything all set and prepared and three people show up uh, for that service. So uh, let me know if you say, yeah, I would like to be here on December 23rd for a normal Saturday service. Make sure I know, okay? So we can decide yay or nay. And if you don't think it's going to work, let me know that too. So those are all the main things I wanted to announce. Uh, we're wrapping up our study in Colossians. This coming Wednesday, live on, on uh, 7 p.m. on Facebook. And then two weeks from that, that Wednesday, we always have a uh, Thanksgiving Eve service with a pie feast afterwards. People are uh, not required to bring a pie, but you can and share with the others. So that's coming up on the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving Day. And... Next week, we're wrapping up our series for the time in between. It's a time to yearn for the end, as we'll hear what St. Paul has to say about that in one of his epistles. So blessings to all. Plenty of bread. Please take as much as you can share with others. And God bless us as we keep watching. Thank you. <laughs>